go on the record. I'm Commissioner Tanola D. Brown Bland, presiding commissioner for this hearing, and with me are Chair Charlotte A. Mitchell, Commissioners Daniel G. Klosfelter, Kimberly W. Duffley, Floyd B. McKissick Jr., and Karen M. Camerite. I do believe Commissioner Jeff Hughes will be joining us. In accordance with the commission's order issued on March the 20th, 2023, the expert witness hearing in docket number W218 sub 573 in the matter of application by Aqua North Carolina Inc. for authority to adjust and increase rates for water and sewer utility service is being resumed and the evidentiary record reopened to receive testimonial and documentary evidence as appropriate as regards the par partial settlement agreement and stipulation between the parties, which was reported to the Commission and ultimately filed with the Commission on March 31st, 2023. Pursuant to the Commission's March 20th order, on March 31st, 2023, the parties filed proposed orders, the partial settlement agreement and stipulation, and supporting testimony. Aqua filed the settlement testimony of witnesses Shannon Becker, and the joint testimony and exhibits of witnesses Dean Gerhardt and David Haddad. The public staff filed the joint testimony and exhibits of witnesses Leon Fiesel and Charles Junis. That brings us up to date, and since time has passed, I again remind members of the Commission of our duty to avoid conflicts of interest under the State Government Ethics Act and inquire at this time as to whether any commissioner has any known conflict of interest with respect to this document. The record will reflect that no conflicts have been identified. And I will take appearances of counsel for clarity of the record and in case there's been any change. Thank you, Commissioner Brown Bland. I'm Joanne Sanford with Sanford Law Office representing Carolina Water. Uh, with me at council table is David Drews of Fox Rothschild, also representing Carolina Water, and Shannon Becker, the state president. With us in the audience, in case the commission has questions that go beyond our panels that, that have pre-filed our panel, <clears throat> we have Amanda Berger, Joe Pierce, and Bill Packer. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Drews. Yes, David Drews, and um, here to represent Aqua, North Carolina. I also wanted to um, uh, introduce uh, an attorney from um, our law firm who's here for observation purposes, Jack Taggart, who um, we hope will be doing some uh, utility work along with me in the future. Um, and well, we hope we don't scare him off and welcome. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Glad to have you this morning. And, and we have some preliminary matters after council. All right. Parents. Let's hear from the public staff. Good morning, Elizabeth Culpepper with the public staff appearing on behalf of the using and consuming public. With me today are Megan Yost and William Freeman. Good morning. Oh, we also have Michelle Boswell if there's additional questions that she could answer in addition to our panel pre-filed testimony. All right, thank you. All right, so now we are down to preliminary matters, Mr. Drews. Or um, we thank you. Uh, we filed a stipulation in this matter. Um, it, uh, stipulation settlement. It indicates that it has attached a settlement exhibit. Actually, that was instead filed with the public staff testimony rather than attached to the filed stipulation. It's in the record. It's just in a different place. Just wanted to note that. Um, and at the appropriate time, we'll um, move the stipulation into evidence. Um, both parties have filed settlement testimony and exhibits and uh, have agreed uh, to the admissibility of that uh, pre-filed testimony and exhibits um, and waive cross-examination while reserving the right to ask any questions on commission questions. Um, and um, let's see what else. Uh, Aqua Settlement Exhibit 2 has a label on it, says it's privileged and confidential. That was during the negotiation process. It is not as filed privileged and confidential. There is no confidential material being presented today uh, or in the pre-filings for the settlement. Um, and um, the 
I would note and and really ask the commission's uh, opinion on this. Uh, we filed a proposed order that was incomplete in formatting. Um, we can, uh, the substance of it is intact and, and would not change if the commission wants the formatting updated uh, to a proper format, we'll do that and refile that. Um, but um, that's entirely uh, within y'all's discretion. There wouldn't be any content change. And it frankly um, probably isn't that necessary. The post staffs is properly formatted and the numbers uh, on revenue requirement are going to change anyway, depending on the commission's decision. All right. Thank you, Mr. News. Anything preliminarily from the public staff? Yes. On March 29, 2023, the public staff filed its second corrected accounting exhibit one, consisting of 58 pages, and public staff co second corrected WISP exhibit one, consisting of 150 pages. The testimony and transcripts, volume seven, page 167, sets out the corrections reflected in the public staff's second corrected accounting exhibit one. The testimony in transcript volume eight, page nine, sets out the corrections reflected in public staff second corrected WISP exhibit one. Those corrected exhibits are the starting point for the settlement exhibits. The purpose of introducing the corrected exhibits is so that the basis for the settlement exhibits is established. The revenue requirement impact for both settled items and unsettled items are reflected in public staff settlement exhibit one. The public staff moves that the second corrected accounting exhibit one and public staff second corrected WISP exhibit one be identified as marked when filed and, and entered into evidence. No objection. There may be no objection that will be allowed and they will be so identified. Both both of the corrective exhibits. We have one more exhibit. On March 30, 2023, the public staff filed public staff supplemental WISP exhibit seven, consisting of four pages. The modifications made by the public staff to four of its recommended performance-based metrics were provided in recognition of the commission's comments and questions during the evidentiary hearing. The public staff moves that public staff supplemental WISP Exhibit 7 be identified as marked when filed and entered into evidence. Is there any objection? No objection given the admissibility of Mr. Uh, Becker's uh, settlement testimony, which briefly speaks to that. All right, that will also be allowed. That concludes our And it will be received into evidence. Thank you. All right, nothing further preliminarily than um, We'll hear from the applicant on stipulation. Um, Aqua calls Mr. Becker, Mr. Haddad, and Mr. Gearhart to the stand. We, uh, with the commission's indulgence, put them all up at the same time so we don't have to keep switching questions back and forth between different groups. That works for us. Thank you. All right, can everyone get the left hand to the Bible? And raise your right. And you're all technically still under oath, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, do you each sincerely and solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God? I do. All right. Would each of you in turn please state your name for the record and your position with Aqua? My name is Shannon Becker. I'm the president for Aqua in North Carolina. David Haddad, consultant. Uh, Dean Gearhart, rates and planning manager for Aqua North Carolina. And have you pre-filed settlement testimony and in the case of Mr. Haddad and Gearhart uh, exhibits with that in this proceeding? We have, yes. Do you have any changes to your settlement testimonies or exhibits? No, no. If um, Ask those questions today from the stand. Would your answers be the same? They would. Yes. Yes. Okay. We'd ask that their pre-filed settlement testimony be admitted into the record and their exhibits be uh, marked as identified. That motion will be allowed. 
and uh, we have dispensed with summaries and they are available for any questions. Um, they're here to support the settlement and they're yours. All right. And um, before we launch in with our questions, I would just ask that the public staff witnesses uh, in the room pay attention because some of these questions, um, you will at least have a chance to um, respond. So follow closely. All right, well, um, all the witnesses may help and answer if you have the answer, but um, we had um, divided our questions in the in the way that the testimonies had been filed. So we started out with questions for Mr. Becker. Um, and um, I'll just launch in, all right? So the the previous testimony, um, from Aqua was that Aqua did not plan to seek an EMF adjustment related to the time period between the start of rate year one, which we now know is January 1st, 2023, and the date uh, the commission issues its final order in this proceeding. Is that still the case in light of the stipulation? There's no change in the original um, testimony that was filed, and, and the reason for that was uh, we knew we had the rates under bond that were going to be issued soon after the January 1st date, so we did not feel it necessary to uh, also incorporate an EMF. And in the public staff's proposed order on page 33 in their findings of facts number 69 and 70, that's um, addressing the 5% statutory rate cap applicable to years two, rate years two and three. Um, and they, are, they have them listed in their discussion of contested issues. On page 154 of, of um, their proposed order, they note that Aqua calculated its WISIP rate years two and three revenue percentage increase based on each rate division and limited it to the 5% cap. Was the application of the 5% cap agreed to as part of the stipulation negotiations? Or is it Aqua's position that the application of the 5% st uh, statutory cap should be by rate division? So I don't believe we had specific discussions on the 5% cap in the out years, rate years two and three. Uh, we have always intended the 5% cap, which is the regulatory requirement uh, under the rule, or under, the, uh, under the legislation, as well as the rule, I believe, uh, should always be applied for the out years. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. We applied our revenue requirement. We, we we applied the cap to the revenue requirement for years two and three, the five percent cap. All right, and then we were asking about the the rate division. Is it? Uh, that is correct, and we did that by rate division. And so the question is, was that five percent cap agreed to as part of the stipulation, or is it Aqua's position that the five percent should be by rate division? I don't know if it's an or. The the rule requires the five percent cap. We adhere to that. I don't. I do not recall having that as part of our stipulation that we would do five percent because it was a requirement. Again, maybe I'm misunderstanding. I'm sorry. No, I think. I mean, it, it signals to us that this was not. That was not a part of the discussion of the stipulation. I I do not believe so. I do not recall it if it was. All right, and. The public staff applies that 5% cap to the service revenues versus the total operating revenues. Has Aqua agreed to that method? I believe we did the same thing. We applied the 5% cap at the service revenue level, not taking into account miscellaneous revenue or uncollectibles. Okay. And it's, it is by rate entity within our model, but I, I think it gets you to the same point. All right. All right, moving on, News Colony uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant expansion. Uh, in, in Aqua's direct testimony, uh, Aqua has testified that it plans to expand that by 750,000 gallons per day for a total of $10.5 million. The public staff testifies that it thinks Johnston County has adequate 
adequate capacity to provide bulk sewer for a flowers plantation. How was this issue resolved in the stipulation negotiation? The amounts that were identified in our schedules for the out years were agreed to in the stipulation as we presented them, other than the two contested areas, which is the SIP slash SAP and the PFAS, PFOA. So the amounts that are in our schedules were agreed to in the stipulation. So that, that includes the wastewater treatment expansion? I, I believe so. I'm not, I, I don't know the exact amounts, but the, uh, the upgrades should be included and were included in the, the stipulation. In the capital improvements? Yes. I, yes. All right. Um, in the stipulation, the parties reached agreement on certain ongoing reporting requirements for Aqua, and as to the public staff's recommendation in its pre-filed testimony that Aqua continue to provide reports on recommendations by DEQ regarding secondary water quality concerns, um, has Aqua and the parties agreed on this reporting requirement? Yes, the reporting would continue. And order in paragraph 38 of the public staff's proposed order does not appear to specifically note the report, but Aqua's proposed order um, in order in paragraph 15 states the company will continue that reporting in um, that was ordered in subs 363, 497, and 526. Is that compliant with your uh, understanding of the stipulated reporting requirements? It does. We would continue as long as the commission would like us to, yes. And the way we read the stipulation, um, had, we read it to be there's no no longer an issue on the aqua, um, on the meter projects and the new colony wastewater treatment uh, plan there, treatment plan. Is that correct? The, the news colony treatment plant, I, I do not believe. I'm trying to remember. There was discussions during the stipulation regarding meters and services that were removed, um, certain meters and services that were removed, but not the meter project. Um, and, and that was uh, related. The request, if I remember correctly, the request to remove meters and services was, be, was because we did not have a corresponding uh, kayak amount incorporated into our plan to offset those amounts. So we agreed to offset those meters and services. I don't re remember exactly the numbers, but the public staff and us, I believe we are in consistent uh, understanding and it is incorporated in the stipulation. So there's no longer a contested issue as regards the the meter project? Not as far as Aqua is aware. And as regards the wastewater treatment expansion at Flowers Plantation for the same. Flowers Plantation. All right. Thanks. Now on um, page nine, lines three to four of your settlement testimony, you state that the parties reached mutual agreement on quote, certain quarterly accounting reporting requirements requested by the public staff related to bridge year capital projects included in rate year one. What's the reasons for this reporting and what specific information will be re um, provided in that reporting? I'm sorry, could you repeat the... the... That was on ref page nine. Last three to four. And this is of my settlement testimony? Yes. I think my page referencing might be off because mine does not have page numbers. Could that be page three, line nine? It might be. Let me check. On, on the third page of Mr. Becker's testimony, it lines like eight through ten. It talks about the um, or PBMs um, that there's uh, an issue with. If, if that's what you're asking about, I don't have the numbers either. That's why. Let's see. <laughs> One, two. Three. Which lines were you referencing, Mr. Drews? 
8 through 10. And again, I don't know if I'm looking at the same thing. If I may, I, it appears under the section overview of stipulation. The first question, please provide an overview of the stipulation of partial settlement. On page 9, I'm sorry, on uh, line 9, it says, after significant discussion, extensive reconciliation by the company of capital project detail necessary to support the agreed upon capital positions and projections throughout the base year and WISP periods, along with extensive negotiations, the parties have accomplished both goals. Are you referring there to the... I'm referring to a quote that specifically deals with the bridge year capital. Okay, I was in the wrong place then. Oh no! I don't, this one's not the numbers. I got to count. Help has arrived. <laughs> Save the day. Page nine. Okay. Right here. So I'm on page eight. It looks like starting on lines three through four. Just to clarify, I'm on the right. Yep. That's so certain quarterly accounting reporting requirements. Yes. That's by the public staff. That's the third third capital. bullet from the top of that page. Mm -hmm. I don't recall if we have the specifics. Uh, we did agree to. Um, there was specific accounting reporting requests that were made by the public staff and possibly was in their direct or maybe it was during testimony during the, the evidentiary hearing um, but there were specific inf requests of information for the capital projects that were being completed between september 1st and december 31st uh, and, and i i'm going to defer here i do not recall the exact details that we were going to provide but it was basically to support the validity of the projects whether they were in service uh, can you help me? With yeah, so I think what you're asking about are a group of costs in the September to December 22 time period labeled post in service charges about 8.3 million dollars that are subject to the commission and the staff's review in the next rate case. Yes, that's, yes. that's what we're asking about. Do we have specific, do you have specifics? Yeah, there's a, there are schedules, I guess, to understand your question. Those are identified in our exhibit two. So the projects are identified in exhibit two, but you're asking of the requirements, the follow up requirements uh, on the reporting. What will we be right. reporting? Why are you reporting and what will you be reporting? We're, well, they'll be, re since they've moved into rate year one, they'll be reported under the rule, under the regulations. Uh, the reporting requirements, and I, I guess the report would show the, um, well, maybe I'm a little confused. These are actual costs already incurred, um, and they're subject to review in a future proceeding, next rate case. And will this review that's referenced here be any difference from that subsequent required review? No, I don't expect it to be any different than, I guess, what I would call a staff audit of those costs. All right, and where in um, where is this specific reporting requirement noted in stipulation section G of reporting requirements? Can you repeat the question, Commissioner? Where can this this requirement that we're discussing now be found in the stipulation? Section G, which is about the reporting requirements. I would have to follow up with you. I recall there were specifics that were referenced, I believe, in the public staff's testimony that dictated what would be included here, but I, I, I do not have that answer currently. I would have to follow up. Or perhaps the public staff would be able to provide clarity when they have their witnesses up. Okay, and d does it appear to you that it's been left out, or you just think it might be subsumed in some of the other words? I believe it's subsumed. Again, as, as um, Mr. Haddad had mentioned, these are actual costs, so they're a little different than projections of, you know, providing the, the, 
the validation of what was in the plan versus what actually happened because these were through year end prior to the evidentiary hearing being completed and i think in our late filed exhibit that was uh, filed in january as well so their actual cost that would be subject to the the review the full review and audit of the public staff uh, outside of any specific items that were identified in the public staff's uh, explanation of the reporting requirements. Okay. Um, moving on to the cu customer assistance. But... Chair Mitchell. Um, Want to follow up with you all. So, um, section H of, again, this is just making sure we understand exactly what y'all have agreed to and, 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 documentation supporting the agreement the um page 17 of the stipulation down at the bottom there's a um paragraph h maybe it's in a section then tell me when you get there i'm here okay you see that subsequent review of rate base items projects for which there are post in service charges listed an aqua exhibit labeled post and service charges mm. okay what is that aqua exhibit and where is it located here's the, trying to think where we, uh, here's the summary of the index if i can uh you yeah. might take a look at aqua settlement exhibit one And, and is that, where is that, where does that appear, Mr. Drews? That was filed with the settlement testimony of Mr. Gearhart and Haddad. Okay. Okay, so it's exhibit one to the settlement testimony of Gearhart and Haddad. Yes. Okay. So I'm looking at that exhibit now. Mm -hmm. And it's a lengthy spreadsheet. And it's in of various projects and associated information for those projects and it, and, and the source comes from w1 item 28 Zach, am i are we all on this looking at the same document yeah we are. okay yes and is that item uh w1 is that file w1 item 28 that source data from the march 31st 2023 filing made by the company Yes. So, okay. but fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, are certain of the projects identified in this exhibit one the post in service charges mm -hmm. projects? And how are we to know which of those projects are post in service charges? This entire list are the post in service charges. Okay. So, to collect, let me maybe clarify a little something based on going through this with the staff. When we looked at the September to December 21 actuals and had discussions back and forth, what you'll notice about um, this list, all these in service dates are pre September 2022 charges, because in the, the, the way the accounting systems work, you may have a project that has more like um, th this, it goes into service and then something else gets charged to it. So we wanted to be clear working with the staff that this group of costs, since they aren't technically September to December, because they have an in-service date pre-September 22, are subject to their audit. So this, this is a complete list of in-service projects actually booked on the company books in 22 that are subject to audit in a future proceeding. It's this entire list. Okay. And so these are projects for which the in service date is prior to September 1. Yes. And is there agreement by the public staff that these projects were in service prior to September 1? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And I'll, I'll, we can confirm that with the public staff. So, the, in you all recall in the you you may recall in the rate case during the expert witness hearing there was discussion about the September through December projections, mm -hmm. 
and um, I, I tried to understand what was going on. I failed. Um, I tried a couple of times, and I'm going back and reviewing the transcript. I, it's very difficult for me to make sense of it. Um, but I, I do read in the transcript that, that there was $18.6 million that, were, that had been projected by the company for September through December, um, but that you all knew and understood that 18.6 to be low relative to what you had mm -hmm. actually incurred. Correct. Okay, so I've got so I've got at least that one basic point right. Okay. So the way I understand your testimony today though is that this exhibit one to your settlement testimony wouldn't cover the projections that you all made for September through December. Is that correct? It's a subset of that cost. So if I may, maybe I can take my shot and explain because I think I spoke with you about this okay. back in January. <laughs> um, so the the at the time of the hearing, the staff had included the 18.6 for September to December 22. Those were estimates in rate year one. So they basically made rate year one a four, uh, 16 month period, right? September 1, 22 through December 1, uh, 31, 23. At the time of the hearings, we were closing the books and said, well, we know now our actual costs for that period were roughly $46 million, or I'm sorry, $34 million because books had, books were being closed, right? And that number did turn out to be just over 34. So in negotiating the settlement, the 18.6 comes out and we took the 34 and working with staff on an analysis of what truly hit the books in, in, for projects that had an in-service date of September to December 22 is, um, is 34 million. This 8.3 is a subset of the 34. It was a delineation made so they would have comfort that they could audit these charges that were pre, by an in-service date pre-September 2022. But this is just a subset of the total costs included in rate year one. I mean, if I had a whiteboard, I'd... <laughs> I, 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 I grant it, it's very confusing. Um, okay, so what, I, what ultimately I wanna know is, and I'm gonna ask the public staff this too, so somebody um, be ready to answer. The, you all have worked through the issue that you presented to us at the expert witness hearing regarding the um, projections versus actual spend for that period of time, that sort of update or that adjustment period of time in the rate case. What I heard the public staff testify to in the expert witness hearing is they had had in, inadequate time to audit and had had not been able to audit at all. Um, a portion of that spend. Correct. Um, what I hear you what what I hear you testifying to right now is that the public staff and the company have resolved these costs, and that the public staff is going to have an opportunity in the future to audit costs that had heretofore been unaudited by the public staff. That's correct. And there is agreement among the public staff and the company as to this issue. Yes. Okay. And can you help me understand if there is agreement between the public staff and the company about avoiding this kind of problem in the future, in a future rate case proceeding? Yes, I think what we've learned is, um, one, the, the approach to a WISP would probably be different based on this being the first time through a fully projected three-year period, and that working ahead of time to report in the case, what is helpful for auditing, post-filing reporting is something that's, you know, we're not both kind of working from uh, more of a silo, I don't say silo, but, you know, we had some some things we just didn't know at the time with this new uh, structure to the rate case. So I, I, I would say from the company's perspective, some work up front to alleviate the, these types of situations could be done. If I may, I would also add that uh, 
we will not be going through another implementation conversion from Lawson to SAP, uh, which quite honestly, this list here, uh, a lot of it is a result of the deferral of our ability to unitize when it was put in place. Um, so these were these costs were placed in service or have a place in service date earlier than the post test year of 831. Uh, but they were not actually put on the books until subsequent to 831. So that's why we want to identify these separately. And actually, I think the public staff specifically requested that we file this to identify this grouping of the September through December costs that were put onto the books post August 31st um, separately, but because they were actually costs that were incurred and adjusted for uh, as part of the conversion, just deferred to a later date. So the timing was off. So I don't anticipate we'll have this type of issue going forward. Okay. Or at least to the extent of this. We'll always have projects that are placed in service in one period and then we add costs down the road for whatever reason, but it should not be to this. It will not be to this extent. Okay. So Mr. Becker, thank you for that additional clarification. So is it, is it appropriate for me or is it correct? Let me use that word for me to understand that. Although you've, you've referred to September through December costs and projection in your, in previous testimony during the expert witness hearing, you referred to projections related to, the September through December 2022 period, because of the anomaly with the SAP conversion, those costs were actually incurred and plant placed in service prior to that period of time, but because of the conversion, weren't recorded until September through December. Is that is that? I'll say significantly. That was a lot of the reason for this this deferral of this bucket of costs, this eight point whatever million dollars. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Commissioner Rumbland. All right, you prompted another follow up, Commissioner Clive. Oh, I, I think I followed your dialogue with, with the chair, but let me, let me be sure I followed it by asking the question this way. Does the stipulation preserve the public staff's right to audit in the next general rate case the bucket of 34 million or the subset of 8.3 million? Which? Effectively both. <laughs> so it's the entire million. bucket of 34 million. Yes. And including the subs, which includes the subset of 8.3. They're right to audit and make adjustments or seek adjustments, I should say. We make the adjustments, seek adjustments in a future rate case applies to the entire bucket of 34 million, which includes the 8.3 that were in service before September 1, plus projects that were placed in service between September 1 and December 31. Yes, totaling 34 million. Thank you. I got it. And it, just to add uh, clar clarity, uh, <laughs> every time I, I it's dangerous to do that. Every time you do it, it prompts another question. Well, I think this came up because the post test year was 831. Yeah. Because these were prior to that, there was concern that that would not be eligible for auditing in a future case. So I right. think that's why this is brought up. Okay. All right. Name of the games, clarity. So thank you. <laughs> um, the customer assistance program. That program is not no, um, is not part of another list that the company provided um, of of issues that would have an effect on the final revenue requirements and rates. But um, public staff witness Darden. On page 31 of her pre file testimony, she stated that removing that $45,000 from the non utility revenue uh, impacts the service requirements and increases the rates for all customers. And um, she therefore says that um, the funding of the proposed cap would affect all the rate payers. And she indicated further analysis was needed to determine what that impact would be. Based on the testimony to date, it appears the public staff believes the repurposing of the $45,000 from the antenna lease revenue to the cap would impact the rates to customers, but Aqua appears to continue to maintain it would not. And we'd like some clarification on that. Um, we'd like to know how that cap activity would be um, 
would show up on Aqua's books. And if you bear with me, I'll just give you some examples so you see what we're thinking about. Um, if the commission approves Aqua's request to repurpose the $45,000 of miscellaneous revenues to the cap, how would the adjustment to reduce the customer accounts receivables balances be recorded on Aqua's books? And if the program is approved, the cap, would the amount of miscellaneous revenues reflected in the total operating revenues for rate case purposes be reduced by $45,000 um, of that, that proposed amount of funding for the cap? So the, the $45,000 would come out of antenna revenues, which are, are they non-regulatory, non they considered non-regulatory non revenue? Correct. And recorded into miscellaneous revenue. Uh, because all uh, avenues and sources of revenue are considered in our revenue requirement, those do effectively, even though they're coming from antenna leases, which is a separate, uh, that the revenues that did not come from customers, it does reduce the revenue requirement for the customer. So it effectively would have a 45,000 divided by 86,000 customers. There would be a slight impact to the rates for the all customers. So witness Darden is correct. Yes. All right. Um, All right, and so that would show up in the way that you would fund and, and administer the program that would show up on the books, that effect? It would likely be, and I'd have to work through this, but it would likely be a reclass from that bucket of revenues. Uh, and I, I do not have the, the draft accounting set up, uh, at least in front of me. Uh, so that amount of money would be utilized to fund those supporting needs support needs for the cap program i don't have the accounting transactions on in front of me i'd have to prepare those but we do have um the issues around this are agreed upon well uh, the public staff's position is they do not agree with the cap program and the utilization of that money for that purpose and we still uh, believe that it is a is a a good pilot program to start and see how this will work out. All right. Now, moving to the um, capital improvements for the WISIP period. Um, and this was of the uh, joint witness testimony here, beginning on page seven, line 12 in the settlement testimony, you discussed the provisions of the settlement agreement related to the cap, uh, related to capital for the WISP. And there was extensive discussion of um, this issue in the testimony um, back during the hearing. Can you walk the commission through the general resolutions reached by the parties with respect to the capital improvement for the period. And in particular, let's start with on page eight, lines four to six of the settlement testimony. I believe this is in the joint. Uh, is this in the stipulation or my settlement? Testimony? I believe it's in the uh, Hadaya Gearhart. Can you repeat the page reference, please? Page eight, lines four through six. There it states the company's WISP capital plan for rate years one through three is represented by the information contained mm -hmm. in revised W1 item 28. Yes. Attached as Aqua Settlement Exhibit 2. Um, and then on, but then on page seven, lines 18 to 21, you state that the plan and service additions, um, and estimated retirement shall be as summarized in public staff settlement exhibit two. Can you explain in general how the stipulating parties resolve the disputed issues, um, related to the bridge period? Is that what we've? 
Sure. Um, so we, we working with the staff, we first agreed to the base year uh, 22 is only going through actuals uh, August through August 31, 2022. So once we all got on the same page with that, we began the discussions for rate year one, which is now the 16 month period that we just discussed September 22 through June, uh, December 31, 23. Uh, in that is the, um, the original estimates for 23 plus the 34 million fully auditable. Um, but then we also made exclusions for the litigated issues around PFOS, PFOA capital costs and SIP, SAP uh, costs. So those were all excluded from the entirety of the WISP period, just set aside because they're litigated, uh, including the base year. So all four periods, uh, we made sure working with staff to eliminate those capital additions that are uh, being litigated. And then right years two and three are essentially what the company filed because um, again, with those litigated items excluded. All right, what's the difference between Aqua Settlement Exhibit 2, right, and the Public Staff Settlement Exhibit 2? Um, I have didn't look closely at theirs. I would expect there should be no difference. Just give me a second. So the uh, the exhibit two presented by Aqua was presented and assembled in the form of W one item twenty eight, so that when we presented it to the staff in the negotiations, it was familiar to them in the format that they used to support their case in the hearings. Um, and you, and, and is this what was represented earlier that the commission is to use the public staff exhibit two instead of aquas? Yes, I'm a bit confused by their, what their exhibit two is because I thought their exhibit one was their entire calculation of of their, of their revenue requirement calculations, which incorporated this uh, company's exhibit two. That included um, the disputed, that was their, that included their version of how the dispute, if the disputed um, issues were decided in their favor, is that what exhibit one is? versus exhibit two, public staff exhibit two. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me say it this way. Their exhibit one is does include the same capital requirements presented in the company's exhibit two. I'm not familiar with staff's exhibit two. All right. I'm, I'm, and I'm not finding it here in front of me. All right. I think the public staff will be able to help us out with that. Yeah. So, so let, let me talk to the exhibit two filed by the company is the comprehensive WISP plan um, by period in the form of W1 item 28 that was agreed to by both public staff and the company in terms of the capital costs that make up the plan for the period uh, for all four periods, base year, rate year ones to two and three. All right. Well, what's the agreement that's been reached um, as to the amount and the timing of including the bridge period capital improvements in the WISP? It was agreed that the bridge period, which maybe this is semantics, the base year of the bridge period, year 22, is only through August 31, 2022. That's the actuals plant and service of just over 12 million. 
the remaining part of the bridge year, September through December, is in rate year one, making it a 16 month, uh, 16 months of data. All right. And um, except for the three contested issues related to the uh, SIP SAP project, the Wakefield filter project, and the PFAS treatment projects, has the public staff and Aqua resolved all disputes related to the amounts and timings of capital projects included in the WISA uh, rate years one, two, and three? Yes. All right. All right. Are there questions from other commissioners? Commissioner Kimmerich? Um, Mr. Becker, I just for my own clarification, um, I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding your response to the question from Commissioner Brown Bland about the 5% cap and whether that 5%, what, what the company's position about whether the cap um, is applied to each rate division or applied to the co as uh, company wide. And I looked back through the stipulation and then also the settlement testimony, and I didn't see that it was addressed. And um, the company's um, proposed order or settlement testimony, I might have missed it. But can, for, for clarification, can you say whether, whether you're in agreement with the public staff that it is by rate division or whether that's a contested issue? And um, the company's position is that it should be the 5% cap should be applied company wide. It is not a contested issue. Uh, okay. Aqua believes that the 5% cap or utilize the 5% cap on a rate division level. Okay. Um, and I did not see that that was specifically addressed in the stipulation. I might have missed it. Um, but it, I think that if anyone can point that to me at some point um, where it might be in the stipulation so that we can um, we, so that we can see that it is, in fact, specifically addressed in the stipulation. And I don't think we did put it in the stipulation because it was an agreed upon item. Okay. So it was something that was previously undisputed. Okay. So we did not address that. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Commissioner McKissick. I guess one or two questions. Uh, and I guess I am uh, curious about, you know, this customer assistance program, the way you have it proposed and uh, how you came up with the $45,000 that is allocated. Of course, it's coming from the antenna revenues, but what did you contemplate when that program was established? I, I gather, you know, you looked at census tract data. Uh, I gather you also did some type of analysis. It wasn't completely clear what it was. And you were looking at recipients potentially being those that made 150% of the federal poverty level. So can you provide greater specificity? Because when public staff reviewed this, um, based upon this $500 cap that would have only applied to a kids, it looked like it would only impact potentially 80 people out of your entire rate base. And, uh, Commissioner Miss, <clears throat> I know it's a good clarifying question, uh, that we have an individual who works in our corporate office who focuses on these types of programs, uh, for all of our states. Uh, and in this case here, I think what the, the intent is, although it's a small amount, it's $45,000, uh, 
Uh, it is meant to be an opportunity to look at developing a program and seeing how it works. How, what do we need to refine? What are areas of opportunity? Um, it is a small amount. Uh, I, I do believe in our rebuttal testimony, um, we countered the, the quantity of people that it might help um, from what the public staff had made reference to. Uh, but I, I don't think the intent is to really be a, a saving solution other than let's look at new programs to see how we can implement this going forward. Where the funding comes from, you know, it was a recommendation that it come from antenna revenues. Uh, there's lots of different, you know, recommendations of where that can come or how it can be funded. Uh, but we wanted to start working on this program because it's not just a program about our customers. At least we were using, we recommended the use of a, of a company called Dollar Energy, and they're well used throughout other states. Um, and when we recommend or make a referral to them, they not only uh, benefit from the funds that we can apply. Uh, the $45,000 amount, but they also make recommendations to partner um, funding programs, whether it's rental assistance or whatever it might be. So they have a network of other philanthropic organizations that they work with. So when we make that referral, yes, they'll benefit from that $45,000 that we would allocate towards them in this program, but they would also benefit through, benefit through other um, a network of opportunities for those disadvantaged folks who may need some assistance. So is it fair to say you were viewing this more as a pilot almost? Yes. And how many potential, I mean, customers that you have today, I mean, anybody extrapolate to see how many that are in arrears that falling into your criteria for those that could potentially benefit would be eligible? Uh, I do not have that information with me today. I, I could pull something together that shows uh, the number of individuals. Um, I don't exactly know the criteria. We would have to try to make some assumptions, I think, but we could potentially pull something together that provides the, the quantity of eligible uh, candidates. And, and to what extent are you all open to funding it with something other than the antenna revenues? It sounds like that's something, I mean, suppose, suppose it came from shareholder money. Instead, so sorry, what, what, what's suppose the suppose it was not being funded, you know, with funds that are coming in that through the antenna revenues that, you know, would eventually be reflected in what goes in the rate base. It came from some other source separate apart. The, the funding opportunity there was just knowing that that wasn't coming directly from the customers. Right. It was why that was recommended. I guess the, you know, the funding amount can come from from anywhere that we designate. I guess wondering to the extent to which you all were still open to doing something further, notwithstanding the stipulation before us today. Well, we were we were we were hoping that the commission would agree that the forty five thousand dollars would be a good amount of seed money to work on this program, so we can see what the results and the impact could be, and potentially expand it down the road and refine it. Okay. And I want to switch gears a little bit in terms of one or two of the other issues that remain unresolved at this time. And one of them is dealing with a PIM that would be established, dealing with the completion of your capital improvements uh, that are anticipated at this time and whether they came within the time frame that was proposed for getting them completed as well as within the estimated budget for the project. Have you given thought to how that might be successfully done in a way that could can satisfy or address any concerns you have relating to the way the public's tap has viewed it? I have. Um, as you mentioned, we don't actually oppose the tracking of that. I don't necessarily believe that the criteria um, has been refined enough to be to, to be relevant to an Im providing a, a relevant impact. Um, alternatively, and during our, our settlement discussions, we I had thought that possibly you know the issue is the the financial impact. The rates are going to be based on our three year WISP plan, and um, that includes the projects that we have in years one, two, and three. Uh, so I thought that having a an incentive or a penalty associated with 
the amount of capital in total that was approved as part of the WISP would be more relevant. Um, and that, that kind of goes along the basis of all of these metrics. We, this is the first case out, right? So we're going to be refining. We're going to see benefits and improvements and find where certain things are more relevant than other things. And one of the major reasons we did not provide a penalty or an incentive with any of our recommendations was we're in that upfront mode where this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, so we wanted to have that ability to let's let's put some things out there. Let's see how they work. And then let's go back and see what makes sense to identify a specific, a specific target, whether it's industry based, trend based or company based. Let's really see what the impact is going to be and is the cost of installing that and meeting those markets um, targets. I'm sorry, is the cost of meeting specific targets that are set. Does that outweigh the benefit that could be result that could result in be provided to the customer? So when it comes to the projects. Our rates are based on meeting certain approved capital limits. And if I don't spend, if, if my rates are include $40 million and if I don't spend the $40 million, I have a potential to over earn. Now, the regulation provides the recovery of uh, any amounts that I over earn on. Uh, in this case here, we have that zero basis band, upper band. So, whatever the authorized ROE is, well, anything above that would be returned to the customer. Uh, so the financial impact of not spending, let's say it's $40 million in an approved year, and it's I spend 30 million, well, my rates have 40 million. So having it a little bit more geared towards the, the overall amount that was approved in rates versus whether a $200,000 project happened in Q1 versus Q3, or even you know it didn't make Q4, but it made Q1, or let's say I swapped and I had to move forward four or five projects that were prioritized in, in 2024 and move them into 2023 because something happened from a compliance perspective. I'm making, we are making decisions all the time to move capital, to move projects, to make sure that we're focusing on the prioritized needs of our, of our customers. And in those cases, some, some projects that might've been tagged for this year might move to next year. And to be penalized on making those decisions um, it, 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 the incentive, there's no real benefit to the customer, right? Because then I might be more inclined to do projects that I otherwise need to move. And from a budgeting perspective, even on those, um, if I have to put in uh, performance measures, that's going to go out to bid with all my contractors, right? So they're going to up the bid because now they're taking the risk of meeting a certain date. Uh, and, and if that's the case, you know, my, my three-year plan right now doesn't have that increased cost that we would expect from requiring performance measures on our contractors. So th there's a lot of concerns along the performance metrics having penalties, at least the way they're described here. Okay. So you're, you're looking more at total spend as opposed to discrete projects and how they might move around and the deadlines for each individual project and the proposed budget for each project as well as its individual completion date. That would seem to be a more applicable um, incentive or penalty because that's what the rates are based on. Now we always, we internally measure how well are we doing. We plan projects and we usually have to you know, describe, well, we gotta move this out, we gotta put this in, but we're doing a lot of that. You know, we have thousands of line items of projects, so we're always moving things around based on the priorities. But, you know, last year when we did our five year plan, that's what we were planning on. But those plans change based on alternative priorities that will change, change your needs. And I gather there will be quarterly reports prepared and submitted for review for how the Absolutely. capital yes. projects are moving. As required, yes. Okay. Now, let me shift gears once more. I gather the Wakefield costs are still in dispute. They are. The adjustment for 25%. They are. Now, from what I recall, that project was supposed to have been completed in six months and it took five and a half years. Is are my recollections consistent with what you remember? I, I know there was a delay. I don't, I don't remember how long that delay was, but I knew it was a, an, an un. Um, a not normal delay. Okay. Now I think 
what's been suggested is a uh, adjustment of 25 percent. What, what is the basis for you all believing that that is inappropriate? Kind of in line with the response I just gave, we were making operational decisions on the run with the information or, or not, as we pro, as we proceed through the projects and uh, circumstances change. In this case, I think we had challenges with the easements and there was some turnover in the management with the church. Um, some saying they weren't going to give us an easement, some saying they were. So we had to navigate and say, okay, well, here's what we have today. And based on the information we know, we made a decision to proceed what was in the best interest of the customer at that time. It's easy to look back and say, well, we could have done this and we should have done that. Um, but that doesn't always happen at that moment in time. And I think, you know, one of the benefits of uh, our performance based metrics and a WISP program itself to have a quarterly reporting of our projects. This is something we would be sharing in our reporting on a quarterly basis and the public staff would have uh, been aware of the progress of that project. And could have inquired about it throughout that period of time. Now, we didn't have it at that time, but that's 1 of the things that, you know, they would have been hand in hand with us throughout that period, seeing exactly what we saw or at least inquiring uh, in, in a more timely basis to determine. Did we are we making a prudent decision to move this way versus that way? So all of the costs that were incurred during that program were. They were part of our operational requirements. They. We made decisions at the time based on the information that was known and available, and those were the costs, and that was the cost of doing business, and in particular with that specific project. And unfortunately, it was we had to turn right and turn left, and it, it did increase the costs. So when it comes to the 25% adjustment that's been proposed, I, I take it from your explanation, you believe it should be zero? I do. It's a cost of business. All right. And then let me shift gears once again to the recovery cost incurred or plan relating to uh, your capital investment plan relating to PFAS. Okay. Uh, of course, PFAS standards are not as clear, specific, defined at this point in time as they might be at some point in the future. And I guess you're projecting out to do certain improvements today that you don't know would be required or necessary based upon standards that might be adopted at a subsequent point in time. Uh, what, what are your thoughts relating to what's been proposed by public staff? So my thoughts are going to be a little higher level. We do have Amanda Berger, who's my director of compliance here, who can answer additional questions if you so choose if you want to get into more of the, the specifics on PFAS. But, um, we set an internal standard standard of 13 parts per trillion, and that's what we are working towards. Uh, what's in our capital plan uh, are only projects that exceed 13 parts per trillion. Uh, EPA has proposed four parts per, tr per trillion, um, and that is expected to be finalized by the end of this year. Uh, I, I think the expectation, my, my understanding is the expectation is pretty strong that we are going to have a, uh, a metric at four parts per trillion or very close to it. So, in regards to what's in the plan, I'm only doing projects that exceed 13 parts per trillion. So, I'm going to have to do those anyway. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I feel confident. I mean, unless something falls out of the floor of this and they don't come up with a PFAS standard, um, I, I'm pretty confident we'll be doing all of these projects at a minimum. When we go to four, assuming that does happen, the population of projects is going to be much greater than what's in my plan. Um, so, so I, I, I do not believe that the uh, public staff's position of not allowing the recovery of the PFAS projects is appropriate. Um, we are trying to do the right thing in advance. Um, I don't know what kind of law, what kind of lawsuits could come out of not acting with this level of information. Um, and it's going to, from what I understand right now, it's going to take about we're going to be given three to five years to install the volume that they're requesting, it could be significant, 200 to 300 um, potential treatment needs. It all have to be investigated, but doing that, we, we currently do 10 to 15 projects this a year, filter projects. That is going to be five, six times what we're doing today with all the other utilities doing it at the exact same time. So um, 
that's not a very large amount of time to, to actually act. Uh, we know what we, we have to do. We know what we can do, especially with these 13 parts per trillion, and we believe that they should be in the WISP, allowed in the WISP recovery. And switching gears once again to the conservation pilot program. I gather right now you have two seasons of data or two years of data that's been accumulated. Um, but you feel that's inadequate to make a determination or assessment as to whether it's been working effectively or what impact it may or may not have had. Um, why do you feel that based upon the data you got right now that it's it's inadequate? I mean, I would think that with the data that is available, there could be some at least um, preliminary assessment as to whether it's working or what impacts it is having. Probably is a better way of stating it. Right. I, I do. First, the when we put the application together, we only had the one season. And because uh, it was filed on June and it was prepared months before that. So we didn't have the second season, which was 2022. We now have that. And I believe we made a filing. Was it a late filed exhibit that we showed the. Well, we, we did a, we did the filing for the second year, which actually, I believe it's going to be on the docket on the 17th. Um, so we, with the, we, we presented the 22 information. And in 22, we actually did see a, de a significant decrease in consumption, especially compared to year one. Um, for high level year one, the impact wasn't really there. The customers actually used more than uh, than was in the model, and we actually wound up paying refunds. Um, this year, we're see we saw, in 2022 we saw a significant decrease, which makes sense. You know, the first year people didn't you didn't remember, maybe they didn't understand the impact until it actually showed up in their bills. Um, but in the second year, we're seeing a significant we saw a significant drop, and actually to the point now where there's a surcharge. So it's it's the second year shown. That is actually making a difference in 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 usage habits. So, using those two periods, right now that we have the second period, would we? we I would make the recommendation that we include and keep the rec, the conservation pilot at least for a little longer. One of the arguments is like, is it seasonality? Is two periods enough? Right, wet season, dry season. There could be some. There's likely some elasticity related to the the seasonality uh, of rainfall uh, right. and, and heat. Uh, so I, I, I just don't see the benefit of, of taking it away without having a viable replacement, just putting them back into the general consolidated rates when it appears that it might be having a benefit based on this last reporting. Uh, I think it would be uh, beneficial to continue to see what happens. And if anything, I think a conservation rate sh should still exist, but do we tweak the bands? Maybe. Uh, but I think a little bit more information uh, should be needed, and it, it's good for us. It, it helps our operations. Um, if it works, it helps our operations uh, by providing additional capacity, re reducing the demand on that capacity. Uh, so I just uh, the benefits seem to outweigh significantly the, the the cost of just removing it. Okay, and and I hear you say the the findings between the first and second year have been significant. Could you add more insight in, in terms of that use of the term significant and what you have actually observed? Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but That's again, right. it's sort of like, you know, year one didn't really have any impact at all. They were actually used more than we figured. Um, second year, after after experiencing it for a year, we actually saw a, a, a notable decrease. Um, I mean, quantifying it, uh, the first year, I think we owed about $100,000 in a refund and then I think this year the number is about seventy thousand in surcharge. So it's a you're actually starting to see the impact that we were hoping to see from the beginning here in year two. Now we're we're not into irrigation season yet on on 2023 yet, but you know the the, the last year seemed to be going in the right direction. And again, this is all part of the filing that I I think um, the indications were that that might, is going to be on next week's or okay. and, and very soon, like possibly next week or the week after. It's going to be on the, the Monday morning meeting. And, and last question is simply this, and this is about an issue, I guess, you and the public staff were able to work out, and that's relating to the audits that's going to be performed. And uh, I, I gather from reviewing the information that the cost that you all have established that it will not exceed is $75,000. But it seems to me like there's a lot of work and data that needs to be accumulated in a pretty quick, short period of time, something like 90 days. 
in, in my mind, that would appear to be a relatively modest fee to pay for consultant time and expense. But how was that $75,000 determined? I mean, what, was, what were the assumptions that were built into that in terms of, I know you're going to have to stipulate to a firm, but the expertise, the skill level, the work that's going to go into the accumulation analysis of the data. Right. Uh, well, the 70, we, we felt that we needed to put a limit on it because the, the, the scope needs to be refined and this working with whomever the, the third party uh, would be who does this audit, we would be working with the public staff to set up that scope. Um, and we were concerned that, you know, uh, it, it could get very large, right? And we didn't want it to be an open-ended review audit. And there's a lot of things that we would have to include here, but we'll have to determine what depth, when I say we, I'm, us with the aqua with the public staff would need to determine the, the exact scope of what is going to be, uh, the outcome in the areas that are reviewed here to, um, uh, to accomplish the, the intended goal of performing this audit to determine what is really needed to incorporate or to, to properly utilize the WISP, whether it's reporting requirements, uh, staffing, uh, there, there's a lot that is in here, uh, but we just did not want to have an open-ended number and that was just part of the stipulated agreement, the $75,000. So let me ask you this question. Suppose you all sit down with a consultant review the scope of services and all the data that's going to need to be accumulated and analyzed. And when discussing things with them, you find out that what you really have is a scope and a project that to get it accomplished in 90 days, you're looking at spending $150,000. What do you do at that point? The stipulation doesn't exactly address that, but what, what I would think we would do there is the scope would be um, affirmed with the public staff and agreed to with the public staff, and it came out that they were going to estimate 150000 I would ask the public staff to consider putting that into a reg asset for recovery in the next rate case. Okay. Or any difference. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Commissioner Kleinfeld. Um, follow up on Commissioner McKissick's last question. I, I will say to you, uh, when I read the stipulation about the proposed scope of the study, I was pleased and impressed. And then I saw the three months and the $75,000 and my eyebrows went up and I thought any consulting firm you're going to hire that's going to do it in three months, that scope will work in three months and for $75,000 is, is going to be out of business very soon. They're just not going to be able to make it on that kind of schedule and that kind of price. So now I hear that maybe the stipulation doesn't fully define the scope of work. And that leads me to a different discomfort is when will the commission know what the actual scope of the, of the management audit is going to be? So, so I do think the stipulation defines what the scope, the intended scope is, but I guess the depth of each of these areas is what's going to have to be decided and determined, or, you know, we, we get a, a, a costing and maybe a different estimate of the amount or the time. So three months, if it's going to be six months, I guess we can't really change that. Uh, but that would be something that we would have to work through. And if, if the effectiveness of the work that's going to be done by this third party uh, be, is, is at a depth that it will supersede this three month in the $75,000, I'll have to work with uh, Mr. Ayers and, and the public staff to figure out how we go beyond, or do we scale back on any of those areas? Well, I, I appreciate the work with the public staff, but part of the part of the attractiveness of the stipulation to this one commissioner is that it 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 helped me get over the hump on some of the issues that were contested about the SIP project and the SAP project, however you describe it, they're part parcel of the same thing. And um, seeing what you had agreed to in the stipulation helped me resolve my discomfort about those issues. Sure. So I, I, I need to know um, not only that you're talking to the public staff, but I need to know, oh, I think the commission needs to know what you finally agreed to about the actual scope of the study, the actual cost of the study, and the actual timetable of the study. When is the check-in going to occur with the commission? Once we get the 
this order that the stipulation is is approved, um, we would then work immediately with finding uh, a vendor who would be able to be an approved, a mutually agreeable approved vendor to perform this work. And once we had that scope and the, whether we do a bid process or the final version of that, I would have no problem sharing that with the commission to say, here's what the, the scope and then the potential price would be if it's different than this. Or even if it's not different than this. You, you wouldn't have any problem doing a check in before you sign, sign on the dotted line with the consulting I would contract. Have no, problem with that, no. Okay. Thank you. All right. Questions on the commission's questions? I do have one. Um, so I believe it was Mr. Becker who was asked a question about um, the the issue with the update and and um, whether you know what contributed to that. I think there um, was you indicated that part was due to the conversion to SAP, um, but. I think there would you agree there was another part that was just simply due to updates that occurred beyond or beyond or after August 31st, 2022. I'm assuming you're referring to the capital activity from yes. September through December. Yes. Yes. And I think I said substantially. Um, and that might have been an overstatement. I, I don't know the exact amounts that were attributable to what was deferred. Uh, as a result of this SAP project, but there were other reasons as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I just want to clarify the that that was not part of the settlement discussions, correct? Like what would happen in the next rate case in terms of updating beyond the um, update cutoffs established by the commission scheduling order. I'm sorry, can, can you repeat that? So you were asked whether there was an agreement between the parties about what would happen next time. Um, and am I correct that there was no discussion during settlement discussions about what would happen in the next rate case in terms of updating beyond that update cutoff that the commission establishes in its settlement, in its scheduling order? There were, right, so there were no specific discussions of how we would cure that issue that happened this time, yes. Um, those are all my questions. Um, one of my colleagues may have a question. I have another question. Um, Mr. Becker, you had said you may need to file for a deferral request in a hypothetical about the conservation pilot program in response to commission questions. If it went over. May need to file, I'm sorry, may need to file a deferral request. So if you, if you want to request a deferral, you would file an application or a petition requesting a deferral to to extend the conservation pilot is that what you're referring to for the dollars of it i, I believe it I, I believe that's what you had testified to i'm sorry I'm, are we talking about the conservation pilot or the audit yes which conservation sorry okay i apologize can you refresh my memory as to what i said we were deferring i'm sorry Possibly one of my colleagues. Uh, I apologize. I'm going from memory here, but did I hear you say about 10 minutes ago that if in the context of the conservation that you were talking about a hundred and something thousand dollar uh, uh, amount of funds, and I've forgotten what you said, that you would like to discuss putting into a regulatory asset? I think that was with the audit. Discussion okay. with the seventy five thousand, and if it, if we exceeded the seventy five thousand, so if we agreed with before signing on the dotted line, if we agreed with the public staff on the scope and then the cost with our third party uh, vendor to do this audit, that it was going to be one hundred fifty thousand, I believe was the number. Yes. That is the amount. So over the seventy five, I would request that that any incremental amount be incorporated into a regulatory asset and deferred for recovery in future rate case. That, that's what I was intending. And if you did that, you'd file a separate request and that request has not been made yet to date. No, we do not know what the cost of this will be. But if you did, you'd file a separate request. Requesting a regulatory asset? Yes. 
Yes, with hopefully the support of the public staff, yes. Okay. Um, that's not part of the stipulation. That's just a discussion we're having in response to commissioner question. That went beyond. I, I do not believe there was any discussion as to the what ifs if it went beyond. We we came up with an amount we needed to to kind of cap because the scope was getting big of the the items. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had some level of cap because this is shareholder money that would be contributed. Commissioners, if we could have uh, one or two minutes to con consult, I think we're near the end of our questions. Just or actually just 10 seconds. All right, Commissioner Duffley is going to ask a question in the meantime, if you can. Um, so I apologize, Ms. Yost uh, asked a question, so I wanted to seek clarification. And it's regarding that capital spend between um, September and December of 22. So I want to just confirm roughly 34 million is that capital spend between yes. September 2020 and December of 2022. Um, there's 8.7 million that's the audit piece uh, of that public staff can audit that piece. And that looks like it might be public staff exhibit two. Um, what I heard you testify to is that in the next rate case, the public staff, wait, let me back up and that this 34 million is going to go into rates in rate year one. It's going to become part of rates. That's what was stipulated, yes. And so, but that I heard you testify, if you can confirm this, that the public staff is going to be able to audit the full 34 million in the next rate case. Yes. Okay. And, um, but that was not part of the discussions with public staff settlement discussions. That, that's an overall summary of what we agreed to, because it was broken down into several different parts okay. because they were actual spend through December. Those are the numbers that were used. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so do I take it that in the proposed orders of both the company and the public staff, there's not sufficient language regarding the issue of retroactive rate making um, that may need to be added to the orders? Uh, that, I, I don't think it's, I don't recall it being in there as well. So maybe that does need to be added. What I would wanted to say out of the 8 million of the 34 million, that's the mm -hmm. pre in service. I'm sorry, the, re the complement the 26 million that's not pre in service to 831 that would be subject to the wisp audit ability of any of the future rate years what we did is i think there was because there was that concern of it having an in service date showing before august 31st that might have been the concern so that's why we kind of specifically identified that and incorporated that also into rate year 1 which would technically make it subject to the normal review um, that would not be rate that would not be retroactive rate making. Okay. But there may be a need for that type of language. Uh, okay. To qualify it. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Sir, so follow up from the public staff on that question. No. All right. Questions on commission's question. Definitely. Just just so I'm. I'm I'll be, very, I'll be very quick. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I understand what each of the exhibits shows because I've now heard public, um, the, the exhibits filed with the settlement documents and I'll ask the public staff to confirm this too when they're up. But so walk me through what public, uh, what uh, Aqua exhibit one shows. And that's Aqua settlement exhibit one. Okay. 
exhibit one is the uh, projects placed in service in 2022 that had costs associated with them prior to August 31st. And in, I remember in talking with staff, we agreed to segregate this and put language around it about the audit because it was in the January to August period that's the base year, but not part of what is reflected in the actual base year cost. So it's a, the 34 million is auditable. This is a subset of the 34, this 8.3 on exhibiting analysis. And it was simply identified because it had these in service dates that put it in the January to August timeframe. So to just, <laughs> to be really clear <laughs> amongst ourselves as we talked about it, um, we did this exhibit to just delineate this as a, um, it's, it's unique to the September to December timeframe because of the in-service dates, but it, it's part of the 34 that is audible, auditable by the staff and the commission going forward. And it's just simply set out as a subset on exhibit one. Okay. That's very helpful. So I'm not going to ask you to go any farther because I think I, I, I follow you so far, but, um, it's identified as post in service charges. Why that terminology? Um, in service post in service would be after September 1st, 2022. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then help me understand what exhibit to, um, to your testimony is. It's the also referred to as aqua settlement exhibit two. Yeah, so aqua settlement exhibit two is the entirety of the base year rate years one, two, and three. Um, has a cover sheet that's a reconciliation, but the detail is the W1 item 28 list of projects for all four, excuse me, all three periods, rate years one through three, because we had agreed with what was presented in the hearing for base year. Um, it's, it's just the detailed records of what support the, the claim for the settlement regarding capital additions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any follow up from public today? All right. Questions like commission's questions. Early on, there was a question about the post in service charges that could be reviewed for prudence um, in the next rate case. And then there was a parallel question, as I understood it, about reporting requirements on that. Um, I'd like to ask you to turn in the stipulation to pages 16 and 17. <laughs> and let me know when you're there. We're here. Okay. And uh, looking at Item G reporting requirements number two, does that provide for Aqua to submit in its quarterly reporting filing under the WISIP information about uh, fourth quarter 2022, the dollar amount of the plant, the original in service date, the manually inserted in service date, and so on? Do you, do you see that in there? Yeah, just read. I believe so. Okay, and um, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask, is that um, reporting requirement applicable to the um, base year charges generally, and um, in particular, the post in service charges? Yes. Okay. I, w I would note that what's in those post in service charges has already been booked, so we expect what we have is what we'll report on at this point. No That'll words. make it a little easier, right? Yes, it should be. Yeah, thank you. Obvious. Um, you asked a question about performance incentive measures. Uh, 
related to cost and completion of capital improvements. Um, let's say an unforeseen pandemic or geopolitical disruption occurs and all of a sudden there's supply chain problems. Um, your contractors through no fault of their own are insisting that schedules are delayed and your costs are going up. Um, if you're under a performance incentive measure that penalizes you for missing budget or schedule, what kind of position does that put the company in? Oh, it's a very bad position, if there, especially if there's penalties associated with it. It's outside of our operational control. Um, you know, we do the best that we can to to be able to manage those to come in on time and on, on budget. Um, that would obviously be a circumstance where we could not control, but we would be penalized anyway. The um, there were some questions about um, the Wakefield project that went way over schedule. Did Aqua make the best decisions based on the information it had at the time? Yes. Okay. Um, PFAS, uh, the 13 parts per trillion um, capital projects planned and requested by the company in this case. Um, is it your intent to address the wells with the greatest risk of health issues first and up front? Exactly. And that's why those with the exceeding 13 parts per trillion were selected and included in this plan. Thank you. You were asked a lot of questions about the $75,000 cost cap on the audit and um, the three month schedule. Um, was Aqua's original position that no management audit was needed or justified? I believe so, yes. And the public staff recommended a management audit with no cost cap. Is that correct? It was it was silent to a okay. cost cap, yes. And um, from what you know, does the settlement represent a reasonable compromise between the positions of the parties? The entire settlement does. And with regard to the management audit piece? We made accommodations to be able to address the issues that were of concern. Um, with reasonable description as to what the scope should be, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. All right. Do we have any follow-up motions? We would um, move the exhibits into evidence as marked. And um, we also would, I, again, I don't know if you want to wait until the buck staff testifies, but we would like to move the stipulation into evidence as well. All right. Is there any objection to a motion and to moving in the stipulation now? No objection. All right. Then that motion will be allowed and uh, we'll, um, the stipulation will be received in the evidence now as well as the testimony in the uh, exhibits filed with. Thank you. All right. Gentlemen, you may be excused. Thank you. Thank you. For real this time. All right. Public staff. Public staff calls Lynn Fiesel and Charles Junius. All right, left hands on the Bible and raise your right. Do you sincerely and solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? I do. I do. All right. Ms. Fiesel, please state your name, business address, and present position for the record. My name is Lynn Fiesel. Business address is 430 North Salisbury Street, Raleigh, North Carolina. 
Uh, the title is Financial Manager of the Water Sewer Telephone Section of the Accounting Division. Mr. Junis, please state your name, business address, and present position. Charles Junis, uh, 4030 North Salisbury Street, Raleigh, North Carolina, Director of the Water, Sewer, and Telephone Division. Ms. Fiesel, on March 31, 2023, did the panel prepare and cause to be filed in this docket joint testimony supporting the partial settlement agreement and stipulation consisting of four pages and two exhibits? Yes. Do you have any corrections to your testimony? No. If you were asked those same questions today, would your answers be the same? Yes. I move that the joint testimony consisting of four pages be copied into the record as if given orally from the stand. That motion is allowed. The testimony is received. I also move that the public staff settlement exhibits one and two be identified as marked when filed and entered into evidence. And that motion also is is uh, granted. The witnesses are avail available for commission questions. All right, Mr. Junis is getting hydrated there. Um, Mr. Junis, going back to the bridge year capital projects, the first question I started out with Mr. Becker, uh, Mr. Jews just asked the panel about uh, stipulation page 17, number two as covering this reporting requirement related to the uh, bridge year capital projects. Can you take a look at that and see if you are in agreement? All right, you're talking about G2 on page 16 and carrying over onto page 17? Yes, and up at the top of page 17, where it talks about the fourth quarter 2022, and it moves over into total dollar amount of the plant, the original in-service date recorded, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. So that that is a recording requirement. We also have the ability to do discovery. And so we will and have reserved the right to audit all of these costs, the basically September 22 um, through December of 25. This entire plan, including the bridge period, is subject to audit and the, the post in service charges, um, which is this additional 8 million and then some IT blankets. Um, any project associated with those costs are also subject to um, further audit and reasonableness and prudency determination in the next rate case. All right, and you would identify that same language as the, the place for us to look that would incorporate this um, this reporting requirement? Yes, ma'am. All right, and as to the reporting requirement, what's the public staff's version of the reasons for the requ uh, requirement and what information will be received or is the public staff looking to receive? So I, I think generally this information is gonna be fairly high level summary, and then we would have the ability to do a, additional discovery to really drill down into the information that we talked about, um, I guess at the start of this hearing, um, when we were previously here of you get into actual planning documents, estimates, um, costs incurred, invoices, um, kind of the, the whole supporting set of, of documents for each project. So I, again, this is fairly high level summary information that would be reported on um, and then would prompt our, our further review. All right. And with regard to the, the matters that remain contested, such as the PFAS, the uh, uh, cap, the assistance, uh, customer assistance program, um, those items. Has the public staff's testimony or position on that changed since we heard it last time? Do you have anything additional based on what you heard already? Did so, you need to add or I, I appreciate the open floor here um, and I, I will. It's a, it's a small open. All right. You yeah. crack the window. I, I will behave myself as best I can. I am also hungry for lunch, so I understand. Um, PFAS before, obviously, there was a huge development there in terms of the issuance of a, a draft rule. Now that still has to go through a considerable comments period. Um, possible legal challenges. We don't know what is gonna be the final outcome there, but as it currently stands, 
you have a, a standard that is lower than what the company was operating from, um, then the, the, the company initiative of 13 parts per trillion, now you're looking at four parts per trillion. That speaks to um, Ms. Berger's testimony of scope of this issue. You go from likely 30 entry points to now 300 or more because you now have also um, the, the index impacting uh, PFNAS, um, Gen X. And so it becomes even more uncertain of how wide this problem is. And now how do you develop a holistic plan to address it? Um, are you looking at instead of the company was proposing source filtration, then in rebuttal, they said, well, we're doing filtration, but there's also these other options of we could take um, entry points offline. We could look at uh, purchased water, but there it was vague. And to the point of it was not reasonably known as required by the commission, by the statute. The statute says reasonably known and measurable capital investments. That has that is not reasonably known uh, once you've now changed the the criteria that you're looking to create that plan. So there is no holistic plan. So to speak to Mr. Becker's testimony today, he's basically looking at it as a budget. Well, you know, seven point eight million dollars isn't going to fix the problem, but what is that seven point eight million dollars going to be spent on? It seems unclear now with this change of, of criteria. Um, and our public staff did not engage in discussions of, of um, what was, if anything is known at this time, if there's any benefit to any uh, actions to clean that up. So I, I think the company's ways, ways to reduce it, keep it under control. I mean, Mr. Hauser went through and I, I went through a scenario of Brookwood, for example, of there are alternatives to point source um, filtration. So quick answer is our position has not changed. I think now it's actually been confirmed that that level of unknown is even wider um, and the impact is significant, but we have to see how the rule plays out and then the rule will allow a period of time to come into compliance. So the public staff stands by its past testimony, believes that it's sufficient for this commission to consider to weigh against anything we've heard today or back then to decide the issue. Right. And I think our, our proposed order um, accurately captures what we believe to, to be an appropriate outcome. Um, you had brought up Noose Colony. Is that one of the things you were referring to? Was an SO yes. Yes. Okay. I just have my list of things that you warned me yes. to pay attention. <laughs> I I'm paid attention and I have a list that I'm supposed to get through here. Uh, and I'll try to keep that as fast as possible and maybe prevent uh, some, some extra questions. So News Colony, we were previewing our, our uh, potential disagreement with that project uh, because it will really boil down to a reasonableness and prudency adjustment once there is determined costs. Um, and part of the problem with that analysis is there is both a, a capacity fee that would be known if you're going to buy capacity today. There is also a portion of essentially the collection and really more the transport system of pumping that waste to Johnson County. That requires upgrades that were not quantified um, as part of our discovery. And so it was an unknown. So there's going to be some cost. We don't necessarily agree with expansion of the news colony plant, but I couldn't give you a viable alternative. And so, yes, those costs are in the plan, but recognize that we are previewing arguments for the future case um, on that issue. So it, for purposes of this uh, decision, this case in front of us in the stipulation, there's no longer contested issue. Again, we were not disallowing the costs as part of the plan, but previewing arguments that we we have concerns here because what we didn't want to get into an issue of, well, you never told us you were you had issues with this plan. The costs get incurred and then we are faced with the, the very high standard 
of prudency. And so we've said, we have concerns. You need to be thinking about the alternatives. We think buying capacity is a viable alternative. We have spoken with uh, Johnson County. They say they have plenty of capacity to sell you. It's really a matter of how do you get that waste to them? And that has not been determined. So we're, we are literally just putting that concern out there. So no one can say when we're four years down the road and the costs are potentially incurred and they went down that path. Well, you never said. I'm saying today, I said in my testimony before you are hearing loud and clear. We have concerns with the plan for Johnson County and news colony. And. I asked him also about the, the meter project. Is that cool? Yes, ma'am. So there is a distinction between replacement of meters and then costs that are tied to new meters and new services. Uh, Mr. Becker did accurately address that, that those costs have been removed from the plan, or you could refer to it as it's offset by CIC. That was our concern that new meters, new customers, they pay a meter install fee or they pay a connection fee that would offset that cost. And you shouldn't only put in the cost and not have that offset. So we have functionally removed those from the, the plan. So we, we are in agreement there, but there is that separate bucket of meter replacements that are included. All right. And is there, I'm, I'm not being as precise here, but trying to uh, keep this, short if I can. Um, with regard to the capital projects and the, the, the bridge the bridge year and all that discussion about the 16 months and what's in the documents and where it can be found, did you take issue with anything you heard this morning? Do you feel you need to add anything to that? And in doing that, be sure not to um, unravel the understanding that chair mitchell has, has, has <laughs> yes I, I understand folks now has multiple times i just want to provide clarity on the public staff's exhibit two because that that was my responsibility that that fuels lens exhibit one with the revenue requirement so this is where those capital costs flow in this is a summary of plan additions from those plans. Pages one and two are from the item 28. These are the projected costs, and I shouldn't have put air quotes um, because that's really hard to capture in the record. It is projected in the sense that we are past the point of when these some of these costs were planned, but for purposes of rate making, these are still considered projected and subject to audit in the next rate case. So that is September of 2022 through December of 2025. Now, on that third page is where I think maybe there's some confusion. This is where we separate it out. The third page of? Third page of Public Staff Settlement Exhibit 2. All right. This is where we delineate to show these are those IT blankets and the post and service charges. Post and service charges are because these costs were unitized after the in service date and after this information was provided to the, the public staff and to the commission. You will recall, I was very frustrated um, last hearing because there was this constant changing of what happened in the past. This is an example of that. Um, these are those unitizations. This was last rate case issue. We said the books have to be closed in a short period of time if you're going to then get cost recovery of these projects, if it's through a WIS sick or if it's now through a WIS. This is really evidence to, to Cloud Filter's concern and our continued on the contested issue of SIP, SAP. This is one of the byproducts of that. You have costs that are coming in late so I couldn't necessarily truly complete an audit of projects tied to these costs because I didn't have the full costs. That's crazy. Nor was I told that I didn't have the full costs. Um, so that's what page three is, is we're trying to set aside that bucket and it's a summary of, of what uh, Mr. Gerhardt and Mr. Haddad 
present in their their schedules and that's where you have the references in the stipulation um to the different documents all right thank you chair mitchell you want to follow up on this we did not destroy your understanding i did something right today <laughs> all right now, mr junis on um with regard to public staff settlement exhibit one do you have that The real boss over here has that one. I did not print some oh, copies that's right. of that. Ms. Yeah. Fiesel, let's get Ms. this is probably for you anyway. On uh, line 54. Oh, schedule. So are you talking up schedule rate year one? Okay. It's described as plant without removing SIP, SAP, P5. Um, can you describe what that line item represents to, yes. to uh, what disputed plant items? So, does yeah, it certainly. Relate? First of all, there's a typo on that line. Should be plant without removing SAP, SIP payphones. So, there's a typo there. So, everything on this page, on this schedule, shows the revenue requirement impact for the public staff adjustments for either settled items or unsettled items. So, on line 54, that means the revenue requirement impact for the adjustment to plant in service. But this adjustment do not include adjustment for SAP, SAP, and PFOS. I list SAP, SAP revenue requirement impact in the next two lines, line 55 and line 56, for presentation purpose to show those two are the exact contested items. They're the exact what items, I'm sorry? Contested items. All right. And so, can you tell us what the what the disputed plant items, what disputed plant items, the revenue requirement uh, reduction relates to? So, line fifty four is the adjustment for plant in service, mostly related to post test year uh, additions, and then after that, there is an adjustment to SAP SAP. That is show on line 55, public staff position is to remove SAP, SAP. Company's position is not to. So that is the contested items. On line 55, it shows if we remove SAP, SAP as public staff recommended, then the revenue requirement impact will be 217,000 for aqua water. And the same idea for line 56. That will be the revenue requirement impact for the adjustment made to remove PFOS, PFOA. Uh, so with regard to line 54, is that, um, is that disputed or is there agreement? That's actually agreed upon because that's related to the post-test additions. But I move this under the unsettled items because um, adjustment to plant in service include PFOS, PFOS, and SAP, SAP. That's part of the adjustment to plant in service. But I move it here to show uh, uh, to show the adjustment to plant service uh, in, related to SAP, SAP, and PFOS, PFOS. So there's no so, other dispute. Correct. The only contested items are SAP, SAP, and PFOS, PFOS. Line 54. Uh, sorry, line 55 and line 56. Could we get a reference to the schedule number words? Yes, that's to find where we are here. <laughs> schedule RY1. Thank you. And I, I would just add, there's an adjustment there on plant because she's reconciling between the company's application and, and the public staff's position. So there were projects that didn't get done um, or it changed. And so that is why there's a plant reduction there. Um, and that has been, to her point, recognized and agreed to by the company. All right. Thank you. Now, question to you about that 5% statutory cap. Um, can you explain the public staff application of that cap to service revenues versus total operating revenues? Yes, so we are applying that to service revenues. Um, and I think all parties are in agreement there um, on that it applies to year two and year three, um, and that is captured in 
um, lens schedules? Yes, so we apply to service revenue and because we believe the rate is calculated based upon the service revenue. Also, historically, the miscellaneous revenues and uncollectibles are really immaterial. So um, we will just apply to service revenue. And in doing that, in, in um, selecting the service revenue only, do you consider that to comply with the statute, the WISP statute? Did you uh, get that's that? That's our understanding of the statute. Okay. Um, why would it not apply to total operating revenue? Do you have a reason? I would say that's go ahead. Okay. I would just mostly it's because the miscellaneous is really immaterial, so it does not really impact that much. And also because the rate is calculated by the service revenue. So we think it's more applicable to apply the cap to the service revenue because that impacts the calculation of the rate. All right. Now, just so we understand your use of the terms, on public staff settlement exhibit one, schedule BY for base year, lines 58 to 61, the unsettled items, there's not a line item adjustment for PFAS revenue requirement impact. In the stipulation, it stated that the recovery of cost incurred or plan to be incurred as part of the capital investment plan for treatment of PFAS. The use of the words cost incurred, is that being used to indicate that Aqua has already incurred some capital costs? Yes. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Because my understanding is that the PFAS, PFAS incur, the actual cost incurred is through September through December 2022. So that is part of the rate year one. So because it's after the cutoff day, August 31st, 2022, which belongs to base year, that's why we made adjustment in rate year one instead of base year. Correct. So basically the, the one pro PFOS P4 project that they have done fell in the bridge period. And so it's being, it is part of the projection and part of the plan. And so that's why it's not in the base year schedule um, it's captured in year one. All right. And still, still um, putting you in a crossfire, Mr. Junis uh, or Ms. Fiesel, but is there anything else from um, the questions asked earlier or from the responses that you heard from Aqua that you wish to, to make a comment on? Um, a couple things here. So there was a comment on the conservation pilot mechanism um, and when that would be addressed. Number one, that data was provided after the cutoff. And also there's been no analysis of like weather normalization to, to Mr. Becker's point. And so to attribute it only to um, rate design, I think it is a bit naive. Um, and so again, we, we're against the continuation of the pilot. I think it overcomplicates what is already going to be a very challenging process with the reporting requirements and the annual review. And then you start talking about either giving back or, or charging customers more money. It, it gets very messy. Um, it, it, it's making, it's caused concerns and you've seen our filing even on just the WISIC and the EMF. So the less moving parts we can have, it's really the better for implementation um, of the WISP. The other you item- still stand by the earlier testimony? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The other item I think was the customer assistance program. Again, the, the, the public staff position is that that was not properly developed. We provided a direct example uh, of the program that they agreed to in Pennsylvania. There's no skin in the game or contribution from, from Aqua shareholders like they did in Pennsylvania. Um, and again, there was no consideration of the amount, the 45,000 and what sort of benefit that would provide to customers. Um, I think efforts would be much better suited 
um, supporting and trying to make permanent lie WAP like lie heap um, for the electrics. They're already um, lobbying to to try to get access to SRF funds. So why not tie that also to something like an assistance program um, that would be federally funded? Um, let me see. Do you have anything to add, Lynn? I think I hit my list, but I'm going to check. All right. He's still checking. I'm sure somebody will ask me a question if I right. missed it. Commissioner definitely stepped up. Can't wait. So thank you for your testimony here today. I think it clarified um, the, the piece I was struggling with. So, so this bridge period, the 34 million, even though we've heard some of it was pre the September 1st date, you, everyone is considering that projected cost. And so it will go into rate year one. So there should not be an issue with retroactive retroactivity. Is that accurate? So the only concern with retroactivity is because those post in service charges are tied to projects that are um, included in pre September 1 or the August 31 cutoff. Um, there would be some risk there that, you know, if there's a reasonableness and prudency adjustment that ties to the these costs continuing to roll in you may be tapping into costs that, that were approved um, in that base year. So I think your, your concern is valid. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Are there questions on the commission's questions? I have one question and a procedural request. The question relates to this last um, back and forth on retroactivity. Um, if this panel knows, uh, is it possible for the commission to approve um, adjustments in a settlement that it otherwise could not do under 62-133 or, or the WISIP statute? I'm not gonna step into that. Um, I think that's better suited to be addressed by attorneys. Lynn, did you? No, I was saying okay. legal, so we're here to address the question. Thank you. Um, and the procedural request is that we had um, some testimony from the public staff on PFAS cost, um, which is not a settlement issue. Uh, it's a disputed issue. And uh, we would ask that Amanda Berger be allowed to uh, take the stand in rebuttal. All right, when we're done with this panel, I'll allow Ms. Berger just to meet meet the exact um, information that came forward, just, just to balance the record out. All right, any other questions? None from Aqua. All right, questions? You were asked about retroactivity. Would there be a retroactivity issue regarding the payroll adjustment? So, so could you could you maybe uh, restate the question? So again? I think you're referring to the the payroll okay. adjustment in terms of in projected years as yes. opposed to a base year. So I don't think there would be a retroactive concern there, um, given that it is in these projected years um and because it's part of the stipulation but yeah but for the payroll adjustment part uh we did discuss that issue that uh we agree that the company will hire the um, third party consulting firm to um, to make audit on the payroll uh, uh, positions that need to be filled and if the company does not Fill in the position that is agreed upon or recommended by the audit company, then we believe the um, commission would have the authority to uh, reserve the right to have a further audit to make the adjustment to payroll 
uh, payroll positions. Those are all of our questions. And I um, have have one question, maybe two, but with regard to the conservation pilot, and you, do, is it possible that uh, do you think the pilot should continue through the WISIP through twenty twenty five? I do not think it should continue through through the WISP. I, I think if if the company wants to do conservation rights, let's apply them wholesale and do it um, and see what But you see wouldn't what... have that as an option. <laughs> you wouldn't. Right, because they, were, they weren't going to commit to that. And so I, I just, again, we, we've stated our concerns with that. I don't want to rehash this too much, but there's concern that that pilot, that sample is not representative. And so you can't even extrapolate those findings and then you can't directly tie those findings to well, the rates as opposed to there's no analysis of whether. But for, for you and Ms. Feasel, would, would continuing it just through the end of the WISIP ease some of the accounting issues that you identified, the problems, make it easier to do? Continuing would make it harder. Um, to, if you continue the, the conservation pilot, it makes it harder to to implement the, the WISP and the annual review. Harder to do the review and make the calculations. Right, because you're going to have potential over earnings or do they fall under? And then you're going to also have an adjustment of did customers reduce their usage? And so then they're owed a surcharge going forward. And so did they really under earn or was there additional revenues there? And then vice versa, if you owe a refund, do you then have to factor that in? And all that is going to be happening either um, coinciding with an annual review or the timing won't match up. So I, my personal opinion is it makes it more complex and harder to, to implement the WISP. All right, is there a follow-up? Follow-up. All right. All right, then you may be excused. You had. You, we admit, you admitted the two exhibits. All right, testimony. and the settlement exhibits one and two. Public staff, they've been received. If not, they received now. Great. All right, and then we want to hear from a rebuttal witness. Aqua calls Amanda Berger to the stand. And Ms. It's my understanding, Ms. Berger is being called to address. Uh, new factual information introduced by the last panel. Yes. All right, Ms. Berger, with left hand on the Bible, raise your right. Do you sincerely and solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? All right, you may be seated. If you would state your name and business position for the record, please. Amanda Berger, Director of Environmental Compliance for Aqua, North Carolina. And did you hear the testimony that Mr. Junis just gave with respect to PFAS and its cost? Yes, I did. And uh, do you have a response to that testimony? I have a clarifying response, yes. I just wanted to briefly state that, um, to Mr. Junis's point, that yes, the company has been actively sampling and identifying the systems that exceeded the corporate standard of 13 parts per trillion since 2019. Um, I testified to those in the last rate case of sub 526 and identified those sites, which were approximately 27 or 28, I think was my comments. Um, he made a comment stating that we had not previously discussed that we were lurking at alternative technologies or alternative options for those 27 or 28 sites. That has been an ongoing process and a part of a plan um, since the identification back in 2019, late 2019, early 2020. So. Those sites have been on routine um, running annual averages, so consistently ensuring that they exceed that 13 parts per trillion standard. I think the second point is not only have they exceeded 13 parts per trillion, they're consistently well above 13 parts per trillion. So these subset, this subset of 30 average around 35 parts per trillion, and that is what we have included in this capital plan to go ahead and address now. Of course, in March, 
I believe it was the 14th, don't, don't quote me on the date, on March 14th, the EPA announced their proposed MCL. The proposed MCL, of course, is four parts per trillion for PFAS and PFOA. There is a health index standard that was also applied, which you um, essentially perform a calculation based on health advisory levels, et cetera, for PFNA, Gen X, PFHXS, and um, I believe PFBS. Maybe. <laughs> I'm working on two hours of sleep, so I apologize if, I, if I'm wrong. PFNA, uh, PFBS, Gen X, PFHXS. Um, I think. <laughs> um, anyway, so they, there's the health index standard. Um, that health index standard has been evaluated at the corporate level. We have evaluated all the data that we currently have at Aqua North Carolina um, once that health index standard was included. There is minimal impact um, to our plan, overall plan, um, for meeting the MCL um, for those particular sites. With respect to the 13, between what's 13 and 4, that gray area, I believe that there's some discussion between myself and the public staff. I think the important thing for, the, um, for us to consider is that what is currently proposed is known. It is known to exceed what the EPA has proposed. It is known to exceed what the company has been stating that we were going to address since 2020. These are sites that need to be identified. We have actively looked and sought out alter alternatives because I don't believe that anyone wants to you know, install filtration where it's not, ne not necessarily needed, right? There's an option. We want to address it with an alternative option, but we have to go about it very strategically and holistically because the other options include purchasing, which we've discussed purchase water and some of the issues associated with those. Um, there's, and that's really the, one of the options. Um, the other option is trying to interconnect, which can also create a problem um, with one of our existing systems or its treatment. So I just wanted to clarify that with respect to the MCL, the proposed MCL, EPA, of course, um, the public comment period is now open. Um, the, clo the closing date on that is May 30th. Once the public comments are received by EPA, EPA is currently stating that it's their intent um, to promulgate by year end. That means that there is a three-year compliance window. So if it were to be promulgated by year end 2023, we would have to be in compliance with that MCL by 2026 with a potential two-year extension currently by DEQ. Now, once again, that's, it hasn't occurred yet, and I can appreciate that comment um, that it hasn't occurred yet, but as a utility with 30 um, known that are greater than 13, approximately 30 known greater than 13, we're looking at an additional close to 200 that fall above four. So there's, we, we have to act and act very quickly. Um, even, even if this rule to, were to be extended a couple years, that's still a very large number to have to address in a very short amount of time. And I just wanted to, to make a clarifying comment on that matter. So just one quick follow up on that. The amount of PFAS dollars for capital projects that are requested in this case do, uh, is that a spend just for the wells or sources that are over 13 uh, parts per trillion? Yes. Okay, thank you, that's all. All right, is there a cross-examination? Um, yes, just one question. Um, I believe you indicated that the company had been looking at alternatives for the 30 sites that exceed 13 parts per trillion, is that correct? We've Yes, we've evaluated them. Um, did you file an alternatives analysis with your testimony or, or go into detail um, about that alternatives analysis in your testimony? I don't believe it was requested. It was briefly mentioned during my testimony, but I wasn't aware that there was an alternatives analysis required for the 30. But, but that's, you're saying that's something the company's done, but you haven't provided details of that. Is that correct? Yes, the company has performed it, yes. Um, those are all my questions. Thank you. All right, any questions? All right, thank you, Ms. Berger. Thank you. All right, 
Anything else to come before the commission related to this matter and the stipulation? None from Aqua. None from the public staff. All right. I uh, just wish to thank you. The commission can tell from what was submitted that a lot of work and a lot of thought went into what you submitted. And speaking as one, but I think on behalf of all, we greatly appreciate um, that level of work because it's, it's for um, the customers and it serves the state and its ratepayers well. And um, we we like to see um, uh, we like to see you um, working together um, and 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 helping us um, get through and understand. You can see how just on the filing of something that seems simple, it engendered um, quite a bit of questions. Um, just before we adjourn, I'm going to double check with my staff to be sure we have covered um, everything and um, and. Um, Oh, she's telling me we have covered everything. Nope, we've not. We've got one more question, so hold, hold on a moment. We'll just take a little five-minute break here and go off the record. So after conferring with my ABLE staff, um, we've determined that we think we have on the commission's questions fully answered. Um, and again, I just repeat that we are grateful for both parties work in, in bringing this case to the place where it is now. We still have a lot of tough decisions to be made, but that's what we're supposed to do. And we assure you we will provide decisions. So with that said, um, thank you again, and we will be adjourned. Thank you.